Women's running, running, running. Women's running stories. Hi, I'm Molly Huddle. I'm a professional distance runner for Saucony and new mom to Josephine. Yes, in this episode, it is my great pleasure to feature professional runner Molly Huddle, who has so many accolades, and among them, she's a two-time Olympian, she is a former American record holder in the 5,000 and 10,000, and so much more. And yes, in addition, she is also a new mom to daughter Josephine, also known as Jojo, who was born just over a year and a half ago. But before we hear more from Molly, I want to welcome you to Women's Running Stories. I am Sheree Louise Turner. I am your host and producer. And this podcast is a proud member of the Evergreen Network of Podcasts. And in fact, Molly Huddle is a co-host in another podcast that is part of the Evergreen Network. She hosts that show with Roisin McGettigan and Alicia Montano, and you're going to hear more about Alicia later in this episode. They co-host the podcast Keeping Track, which, of course, I always recommend. They focus on women in sports as well. So, yes, Molly Huddle has been a competitor in the national and international ranks of running on the road, cross-country, and on the track for years. And these days, her focus is on the marathon. To date, Molly's marathon PR is 2 hours, 26 minutes, and 33 seconds, and she ran that at the 2019 London Marathon. We featured Molly on the podcast earlier here in 2023 in March, just after the New York City Half Marathon. And just previous to that race in January, she ran the Houston Half Marathon, and she finished in a really strong 70 minutes which also meant that she earned her Olympic Trials Marathon qualifier. So yeah, she is looking down the line at running the Olympic Trials Marathon in February of next year, 2024, in Orlando, Florida. On her path to that goal race, Molly chose to race her favorite marathon, the New York City Marathon, which she just did on November 5th. And this was Molly's first marathon back since having Josephine. And that is where the focus of this story will be. The build to the New York City Marathon and how it all went down on the day. In addition to all of the context that comes with that journey. And to understand how all of this came about, we need to go back to March, right around the time of the New York City Half Marathon. Molly had been having some hip pain in her lead up to the half marathon, and then she got the kind of news that no athlete wants to be told. Here to tell the story is Molly Huddle. I remember it was right after the New York City half, and that's a week before the race is when that hip pain cropped up, and I kind of wasn't sure what it was because bone injuries, you kind of don't feel that much pain until they're really bad. So I did have a grade three stress reaction in my femur. And so that's pretty serious. We had to just take basically three months off, which was frustrating because my workouts, I was looking at my training log (laughs) and they were getting pretty good by then. You know, they were kind of getting back into like the territory of, you know, I'd run a 70 minute half and things were starting to feel good. And so I had to just cross train and I did lose a lot of fitness, but um, I started running again in July 1st, I think was like my land running (laughs) start. And that's pretty late to try and think you could go from just running again to a marathon in a few months for the fall season. But we really wanted to try because I just wanted to get a marathon under my belt before the Olympic trials, which would be this February. So yeah, we did a very conservative buildup and made it to the start line (laughs) and are hoping to kind of stack another buildup on top of that. But um, it was definitely kind of frustrating to do so much less than I'm used to and know that that's just what I'm going to have to go to the line with. <laughs> but I think it, it was really all I could handle. You know, this, the buildup was steep and I just, I wouldn't have been able to make it to the start line if I had done our normal load. I kind of could tell, you know, my body was 
uh, kind of, I would bring it to the edge and come back and bring it to the edge and come back. So, but it was great. Yeah. It ended up being a successful buildup in that way. Going back to that bone injury, however, there was concern about what had caused it. Among the considerations was the syndrome of relative energy deficiency in sport, which is more commonly called red S or REDS. I saw a few doctors like regarding the stress fracture because I have never had a big bone injury like that before and it was unusual. And um, luckily there are like some new resources in the field and some great doctors nearby. Um, so in Boston, I saw Dr. Tenfordy, Adam Tenfordy at the running center, and he was helping me like with the actual bone healing and the biomechanical side. And then Dr. Catherine Ackerman at Boston Children's, I think, is where her program runs out of. And she focuses a lot on uh, female athletes, um, endocrine health, reds, all that stuff. And she was, she did some blood work. And I think she was, she was saying, you know, I don't think it's necessarily an energy deficiency because, you know, your, your hormone markers would have certain signs, but it is, it is hard to distinguish. You know, there is that question mark. So Molly continued her search for answers. I was recently talking to one of my friends who, she runs the website Redefining Health, Mel Lodge, and she was actually bringing to light some um, new research about like how to distinguish between REDS and lactation symptoms. And it's actually really difficult because, you know, when you have REDS, which is like an energy deficiency, really common in female endurance runners, you know, you lose your period, um, you feel tired, similar to if you're breastfeeding, you lose your period and you feel tired, but it's not from an energy deficiency. So it's like really hard. It can mask reds. And I wonder if I tipped over into that just from such, you know, big life changes. I just wasn't taking care of myself enough. And I think maybe that lent to the bone injury as well as breastfeeding is going to like take some of your minerals away, no matter how well (laughs) you're trying to restock. And I think maybe that contributed. And then just maybe biomechanics from I did have an ankle injury, so we think it's maybe a perfect storm, but I do wonder, like, now looking back, like, how big of a role REDS might have played. It's kind of hard to diagnose. Um, I guess you talk to a dietitian. I'm not sure, but afterwards, I was kind of like, I'm a professional athlete. Like, I know how to take care of myself, and I still just, I don't know if blood work would have helped earlier, or I just feel like there were some missteps that if I, you know, faced those, a lot of new moms might. And I just was thinking, you know, we have some women who are hoping to make this Olympic team in the U.S. uh, alone um, who are new moms. And so I was kind of trying to, I don't know, just get the information more accessible. And I was speaking to doctors at the FASTER program out of Stanford and Dr. Ackerman and Dr. Tenfordy. And I was I was thinking maybe an infographic would help just so like if you're a busy mom, you can look down on the paper and be like, hey, your vitamin D is probably low, your iron's probably low, get that tested, take those supplements, you know, know this about your bone injury risk right now. And that might make, that might've made things easier. Cause I do feel like I was aware that it was a risky time for bone stress injuries, but I kind of wasn't making appointments for myself or anything like that as far as blood work goes, or like, I kind of was just running and that was it. Like, I just felt very spread thin. Um, basically, I just was like really busy and my hands were full all the time. <laughs> so it'd be nice if it was just like there for you, delivered by your federation or by, you know, if you're a high level athlete, like your federation should be like, hey, new mom, like here's our package for like how to get back out there. So that's what I'd like to help facilitate. <laughs> what practical things can we do to actually make it easier? While Molly was cobbling together possible reasons why her bone health had been compromised, she was also healing and planning the next steps of her professional path. Well, New York is my favorite marathon, so that was a perk. I had planned to actually not to race that late, though. It's pretty late when you know you're going to come back and run the trials in February, and I had hoped to run... Like Chicago, just because I don't want to travel. I didn't want to travel with the family. I wanted to do a race that was in the U.S. I didn't didn't want to go to Europe for like two weeks to get used to the time change with JoJo or leave her home that long. So, you know, it was going to be like a Chicago or a Toronto or, you know, something like that. But those, I mean, they crept up so soon. I really needed the, it was kind of this combination of like, I need the extra time to be ready enough to run 229, but I also need, you know, it to not be so late that I can't come back. So in the end... You know, New York was 
just a more enticing marathon to do. And I, it's, I love it. I was very concerned about the time not being fast enough just because I knew I wasn't very fit either. And so you always do leave a few minutes out there. It's just a hard course with the hills. Um, little did I know how many minutes we would be leaving out there with the tactics, but yeah, I, and it was also like, I, you know, a lot of the women were talking about how hard it was to get into these fields because, you know, Chicago filled up so fast on the elite women's side. I, I guess everyone just wants qualifying times, you know, and not just Americans, like from all over the world, if the Olympics are coming up, a lot of athletes need to hit times and want to go to those fast courses. So that was kind of another barrier. Like, I think even if I was ready, I would have had, I struggled to get, um, into the race. It was an unusually deep year. Usually Chicago is never that deep, but I think just like I said before with the qualifying times, they were overwhelmed and had to make some decisions probably for, for a budget reason. And then, you know, it's a Nike sponsored race. Like I would guess that they favored Nike sponsored athletes and they favored past people that had run well there in the past. You know, that usually is like, if you come and you finish second or third here, we're going to want you back the next year. So they probably got preference if you were in that position. And then I think, you know, some races really value like your PR coming in as a ranking tool and some value more like your personal story. Like they do more, like New York does more storytelling with their athletes and Chicago, I think is like, Oh, you just, you gotta be one of the fastest people. So that would be my guess. But like, I don't really know. I think they just had way too many people (laughs) inquiring. Yeah. Usually they're like, we only have usually like five of the top women in the world. Now we have like 20. What do we do? But I wonder if I could have showed up for zero appearance fee or if they were actually like, no, you cannot come like that. It was unclear to me. But in the end, at the end of the day, like I considered showing up for no appearance fee and asking about that just to get a time. But to me, that was like, it seemed unnecessary for me. I was like, you know what, we'll just pivot. So Molly pivoted away from running Chicago and toward her favorite marathon, New York City, because at New York, she was accepted into the elite field and because that gave her extra training time. Chicago took place on October 8th, almost a full month before New York. And to be very clear here regarding times, Chicago is flat and it is fast. New York is hillier, so the times are aren't as fast. Or like Molly said, you leave a few minutes out on the course because of its difficulty. All things considered, however, Molly chose New York. And even with this extra time to train, it was a quick turnaround from injury to major marathon. Add to that, Molly had her sights set on running the Olympic standard of 2.29.30. This is the time that women have to have run in order to be able to run the marathon in the Olympics, if they make the Olympic team. For Molly, hitting that time at New York wasn't critical, but it did factor into her race strategizing, along with several other considerations. It was really interesting going into this race because we knew I was not very prepared, but yet the top end of the field was so good we were kind of like, how are you going to manage this? Like you might just be running by yourself the whole time. And so we, we were just trying to predict what I could run time wise and know that there was value in that for me finishing a marathon and also, you know, checking off a standard if I could, um, which in the end I didn't do, but (laughs) that was our plan. You know, our, my coach was kind of building me up and I was built psyching myself up to run alone the whole way because with women like Helen O'Beary and Latez Nabet Kide and, you know, past champions like Sharon and Bridget Koska, who had the world record. I mean, you had women, you had five women in there that could arguably have tried to run like under 215 in the marathon. So we were just like, yeah, you know what? You might need to let them go and just hone in on that like 541 pace that you've been doing in practice. Um, so that's kind of what we were prepared for and what we talked about. And my coach was like, you know, you're, you're, you're fresh. <laughs> and so I did, I do think we did a good job getting to the start line feeling good. Like I was a little undercooked, but I felt good. So that part was good. And then when you get to like a week out, I just try and reframe it so that everything is like reframe it in a way that makes me feel confident <laughs> because that's all you can do at that point. you like, you have the fitness you have and the field is what it is. And you just have to make it So that to you, it's a good situation. And that's what I was just thinking, you know, you've done a lot alone. So like, at least people will be cheering you on (laughs) this time. And there's standards to hit. And this marathon is only going to help you for the next build. So I was just finding all of the, all of the positive parts of that situation and 
focusing on that. <laughs> With the training done and the race plan made, all that was left to do was race. And indeed, Molly was part of a really interesting field, which was small but mighty, featuring some of the best marathoners in the world, including former marathon world record holder Bridget Koskai, returning New York City marathon champ Sharon Lochetti, 2023 Boston Marathon champion Helen O'Beary. Yeah, the top end of the field was stacked. Also in the mix was Kellen Taylor, who, like Molly, is a top American pro, and she was also making her postpartum return to marathoning. And at 8.40 a.m. on November 5th, 2023, the 14 runners who made up the women's elite field lined up, and the gun went off, sending them on their way to race the 26.2 miles of the marathon. So it, the two other times I'd run New York and many other times, uh, that first mile is very slow and everybody sticks together, which happened again. I think Kellen, I remember talking to Kellen on the bus and she's like, I hate that. Like you give up 30 seconds in the first mile. I'm just going to go. So when she went, we were like, okay, I know what you're doing. You know, you don't want to waste that 30 seconds, but it's a big hill. We were all together. And I was like, okay, like, you know, I'm sure the racing will start pretty soon because it's a beautiful day. You're going to go for the course record, all these talented women up front. Why wouldn't you go for the course record? And we stayed together through 5k when we hit Brooklyn and I was like, okay, they'll probably take off now. Brooklyn's pretty flat. And we were still together. And I was like, oh, weird. Okay. Maybe it'll be a tactical day. Uh, I'm very surprised by this. And so I was happy. I was like, what a gift to be running with the pack. You know, I thought I was going to, I was psyching myself up for a lonely day and like the weather's great. And I have all these women to run with and we're running the pace I want to run. You know, we were on 70, we went through the half in 74 minutes and I was like, this is perfect. Like, yay. <laughs> like, like, what a great, like I've, you know, there's not too many days where you're like, Oh, everything, all the lucky parts are like falling into place for me. And then I, I had totally prepared like for the lead women to just take off after halfway. That's happened a couple years in a row. Um, or uh, there's been a couple years where I've raced and that, you know, the second half's very hard. They take off and make a big move. And once we got off the bridge at 15 miles, like we were running even slower on first Avenue, which is when most people have their fastest mile split. I think our mile was like six Oh something. So it was just weird. You know, I, everyone was looking around measuring. I think the women were just measuring each other's like, energy and like thought like I don't know this all it all seemed like there was a lot of like tactics going on and just the next 10k or six minute pace after six minute pace and at that point that's when I was like oh your times I was hoping to hit are probably going to go out the window so I was kind of jockeying between like I don't know if I should take the lead and just start running 540s because to women, I mean, to women who are this talented, 540 and six minute pace is still tactical. So I was like, maybe they'll, they'll come along. And so typically that is something I would do. Like I'm the type of runner who, if you, if there's a pace I need to hit, like I'll just go. Like I do that in prelims a lot, like even at the world level, I'm just, I'm too nervous. The time gets in my head and I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to go do this and make sure I get my like qualifications. But for this particular buildup and this race, I was so worried about like the drudgery of like hauling through New York all by myself. And I've done it before, like my first marathon there because the elite women start, you know, on their own, 20 minutes ahead of the field. And because our field was only 14 women big, I was like, you're going to be alone and you're going to be just like 2016. You're going to run like 16 miles all by yourself, just like a long tempo run. And I just like, I don't know, like, the opportunity to run with the pack was there and it's just so much better to like be engaged in the race. That's kind of what was pushing and pulling. I was like, you know, you thought you'd be chasing them by yourself, but like, if you go to the front, they've, the pack clearly isn't interested in going with, cause Kellen and I were kind of testing it. Like we would go for a mile and no, there, this gap would open. And I was like, you're just going to get the gap and try and run five forties by yourself in the front of the race. Like it's basically the other, it's like still running by yourself, which you didn't want to do. And they're going to pass you anyway. Like if I were to just go run my pace and build up a big lead, like I know I'm going to get caught by these women. Like I know these women can run, even if they've had kind of poor buildups, like they're so talented that like, you know, they could 
they're going to reel me in eventually. So you know that's coming. So you kind of want to run more in the like you don't like you kind of want to follow their moves more so than make moves unless you know you're really ready to like uh like battle with them basically fitness wise. So, you know, I went in knowing that. Like I was like you aren't ready to <laughs> to be running with them at the, you know, at whatever pace they're able to really run at. So, there's that to be aware of and then you know that's kind of explaining why like when I go to the front, like I'm of no threat, like they know my results. They're like, you're not going to run away from us. So no one went with me. <laughs> um, that's what that meant. And so you're kind of just aware of those dynamics with the tactical side of it. And you're kind of aware of like when you should make moves. Like, let's say I, I was really fit and was hoping to mix it up for a podium position. Like it, it would have been kind of good for me to sit and try and just outkick someone at the end. Um, cause I know I'm like more of a track person, you know, and it, it's just a lot of things like that going through your head. But most of the time I'm just, I feel like I'm in over my head just because I'm aware of their PRs and it's hard to not be afraid of the talent level. Like, cause you still want to do your best in that climate of like world record holders all around you. And you don't want to be afraid because if someone has an off day, like you want to, not just put yourself out of the race, but you have to really know also what's realistic and what like max. I feel like I've maximized myself in those conditions before by like tuning into my body and not trying to go with something that I know is going to be too hard for me and like really respecting like the talent level of these women and like knowing what I can, what moves can I do and what can't I do, especially in a 26.2 mile race. So like you might as well run with them and try and close heart, just like engage in the race, just like race. <laughs> so at that point, I just decided the time wasn't as important. You know, I could get the 229.30 at the trials. So I eventually was like, yeah, you have to be concerned about the time, but like, just, you know, this, this is more, this is valuable too, to like run with these women and have a good experience and you always want to race. Like you just, you want to be, you want to race. That's like the best, like when you have people to run with and to race. And so I just, yeah, I was like, it's a gift that they're, you're even like running this pace. So just take it. <laughs> it was a weird day. We were all just like afraid or something. I don't know. We were all just like hanging together. I think maybe the smallness of the pack, we were all very just like, let's just have a great 20 miles and then we'll see what happens. Um, that's the vibe I got. I was like, let's just chill everybody. Like the Olympics are next year. Like it's a nice day. <laughs> so yeah, I sat in there and just enjoyed it after a while. And around 20 miles, there was a surge. I don't know how hard it was. I think it was probably 530. It wasn't huge, but my legs also started to just fall apart a little bit. So it's, you can fall apart in like different ways at the end of a marathon. And this was just my quads. Um, I didn't bonk. Like I've done that before. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't like tapped out, like visit, like my heart rate wasn't high or anything. It's just, they got, my quads got really beat up and just kind of stopped powering, you know, like after the race, I couldn't like, I sat down and like, I couldn't stand up. Like they were kind of like cramping almost. So just pure muscular failure is what in my quads is what was happening. <laughs> Yeah, like at mile 21, I started to just kind of fall off. There was like a slight like hilly turn in my let. That's when I noticed it in my quads. I was like, ooh, like this through this like terrain kind of just like I got like a dead leg. Like and, and the women started to run away. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to have to like if I want to finish, I'm going to have to just run like 550 pace into the finish. So I tried to just I, I like willingly let them go at that point because I was worried I would like my legs would like buckle. So the last 10K, I just was like imagining my tempo loop at home. I was like, just do the tempo loop. Like here you are in Providence, <laughs> like just close your eyes and just like grind home. So you don't slow down too much, but like stay on your feet. Um, so I think the last 5K, I was like, oh, I'm just surviving. Like nobody look at me, please. <laughs> I think I still ran like 555 pace or six minute pace for the last three miles, but I was like, oh, it's not looking good. <laughs> Um, which is disappointing. I thought, you know, with that slow of a pace, I would have something left at the end. But I think just that's where the the lack of training kind of got me. <laughs> so the last three miles, my quads were pretty wrecked. Molly's quads were wrecked. And something that very likely played a part in that was the fact that this was her first marathon wearing super shoes. I felt great. But then I think they do put a lot of load onto my quads the way I run. And so I think part of it 
was lack of training, but also part of it was just the shoes were putting a lot of force into my quads on a hilly course too. So um, yeah, t- definitely the most sore in my quads I've ever been like the days after the race. But then like everything else felt very like my calves and my hamstrings and everything was like fine. Just my quads were way overcooked. But I think I do think it's something I can get used to because it was only the last 5k. And like I said, I was training much less than usual. So I think that'll get better. Post race then, Molly had this experience to process with her agent, her coach Ray, and her husband Kurt, before moving on to the next steps in preparing for the Olympic trials. I was feeling really happy with the fact that, like I said, we were all stuck together for 20 miles and I had a great experience through 20, but then kind of bummed that I ran 232. And I was doing the math, like as I was running the last 10K, I was like, okay, like this is going to be over 230 by a lot. Like, uh. so I was kind of like feeling bad for myself, but trying to just like get to the finish line over the hills the best I could. And, um, yeah. So within the first few steps, I was like, Ooh, that's not a great time. Like, uh. and then, um, I wasn't sure what place I'd got. I was like, oh, I think I was like last, I don't know. <laughs> but I, my agent came up and was like, oh, you were ninth. Like, you know, that was great that you guys all ran together and you were mixing it up as much as you could. And yeah, I was kind of like six minute pace is like actually way too slow for me. Even right now in my, <laughs> with my poor buildup, like that would have been way too slow. So I was kind of just like trying not to get too wrapped up in the time because everyone everyone in the race was running 231 pace until 21 miles to go or at 21 miles so it's such like we all just were like throwing away the watch but it's tough because afterwards you do get people that only glance at the results and they're like oh you suck (laughs) and you're like okay well I we were all running slow until a certain point so yeah that part was tough but then you know my quads started to hurt and I was like thinking more about those and trying to like get to a bench (laughs) and then was like okay like after this like go find Jojo and Kurt and Ray and talk to them and see what they think and then start recovering because after this it's trials mode. While Molly's life as a professional runner is primarily focused on training and performance, she is also well known for contributing to the sport in other ways. She's written many articles about running. She co-authored the book, How She Did It. In addition to being the co-host, along with Alicia Montano and Roisin McGettigan of the Keeping Track podcast, among several other pursuits. I just am compelled to do projects. I don't know what it is in me. Um, when you're just running every day and doing all the gym work and all the body work, it can get a little bit monotonous. So it's it's a fun way to like just keep my brain busy, I guess, and do something that feels um, important. But yeah, I, I like to just get involved in the running community and um, try and like use running to like just improve my community and try and like help in the running within the running community make it a better place than I found it and just yeah I don't know that's just what I I really enjoy that stuff and where I did actually did fundraising for and mother with this marathon buildup and that went really well we our goal was five thousand dollars and I think we got to like basically like four thousand five hundred and like I'll, I'll put in the other but like we actually then got like a donation from Vita Coco for another 5,000. So that was like really cool that like that, you know, we, we exceeded our expectations there for Ann Mother and their whole team raised like a, a great amount of money. So Alicia, our co-host, founded Ann Mother. She also raced New York. Um, we didn't get to cross paths because we were both just doing so many like events. Like New York has so many pre-race events. It's like so exciting, but also exhausting. And so... Alicia started this, I think, in official capacity a couple of years ago, but it was based on her struggles of, you know, having her children during her running career and just losing support from her sponsors and, you know, knowing that this is a struggle that elite athletes face. But it also mirrors the struggle faced by career women in our country, period, who try to have children. And there's just a lot of barriers there. Um, so Anne Mother hopes to remove those barriers and give support to women who want to thrive in their career and motherhood. And so they do things like provide childcare grants. They've lobbied for support for moms, like at like a government level, (laughs) you know, Alicia has been to the white house a few times. They've 
done things like help change contract wording for women's sports contracts around the postpartum pregnancy period. Um, they provided lactation stations at this year's New York City Marathon. Um, so they're really doing a, they're really doing an incredible amount of work in a short amount of time. And I always say, you know, I've benefited from it. I've already benefited from their contract wording precedent that they've set. So I really wanted to help support them. In addition to efforts like supporting and mother, Molly is also actively joining the conversation about pregnancy and the postpartum return to competition for professional athletes. This is a conversation Alicia Montano helped start years ago. Very notably, she raced with her baby bump, that is, when she was visibly pregnant. And the conversation around having children for women athletes continues to be a work in progress. The messaging around sort of the postpartum comebacks in sport it can get a little confusing, you know, like when we, Alicia wanted to talk about it as sort of, um, you know, she raced with her bump, but it's not necessarily telling pregnant women to like go do feats of endurance. Like it's more just like awareness that like this is her career and like she wants to be supported in her career and her motherhood. That's what she was saying with that, you know, and I feel like it can get misconstrued as like, she phrased it like no days off when you're pregnant. And it, we were just laughing because we were like, that's not what we're saying. We took it like, we we listened to our bodies and um, we're not like pressuring women to like, you know, do marathons within six months of having babies. It's just, this is our career. We're talking about it from a career standpoint, really. Um, and how do we get back to our career in the phase of motherhood and do it in a way that we feel good about, you know, the having enough time to healthily come back and having enough time to be with our family and just, it's a building time. I feel like we're kind of, that's getting minimized in the conversation. And that's empowering to admit, like, how much time do I really need? And how much time am I going to get to build back? But yeah, like, I don't want to minimize that because that felt you feel so different. Like I still feel different. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to finish breastfeeding and I'm kind of hoping like fingers crossed that like, I'll feel like my old self again. Like I'm kind of like, am I, I feel a little bit of a loss of um, kind of like muscular power. And I'm like, am I imagining that? Uh, or is it from breastfeeding or is it from aging? I don't know. So like you do feel just a little different for a long time. And I don't want to pretend that that's not there because it is. It's just something you got to work with and acknowledge and allow for. I feel like there's a little bit of mixed messaging of like pushing women to be like pushing their physical limits too soon. There's a flexibility there that we need to have. And um, I feel like just the, we, we're coming from a place where we used to not talk about it at all. And now we're talking about it, but like the messaging can get taken in different directions. And so um, I just feel like it's phases of putting the conversation out there. We're in that phase of like kind of clarifying <laughs> what we're trying to say. So, As a current pro, Molly continues to bring her lived experience to the table to help the sport of running move forward. And most definitely as a competitor, she continues to go after big goals. Yeah, the marathon trials, I'm, you know, that's motivating. It's, it's kind of like the focus is just get my body help like get my body to like do what it's supposed to do basically in this buildup because it's so soon after another marathon so there's going to be a lot of you know gym work and PT work and stuff it's less a focus on fitness and more like you got to be like sturdy and ready and then I think I still would love like with the super shoes being what they are and having not raced on a flat fast course in a while I think London Marathon is really the only go I made at a fast time pre super shoes. Um, I, it keeps me going to see if I can PR in the marathon that sub two twenty six I think is there. Um, so, you know, maybe in the spring, if my body's okay, or in the fall, uh, next year, I'll be able to tackle that. I hope that keeps me motivated. Cause I do feel like the marathon is in a, it's a distance I haven't like nailed. Um, and I, I'm not the athlete that like I used to be for a lot of reasons, but I think that's still there for me that, you know, that improvement. That does bring us to the end of Molly Huddle's story on the podcast, for now at least. Thank you so much, Molly, for coming on the show once again. What an honor and a pleasure to get to share your story. I just love Molly's insights into training and racing, 
her experiences as a new mom and a professional athlete, as well as hearing about all the ways she's involved in the running community outside of racing. And absolutely, I wish Molly a really solid and strong build up to the trials and a great race and the very best to all that comes after that. You can join me in keeping up with Molly and cheering her on. She has a great Instagram feed and I will definitely link to it in the show notes. There, I'm also going to put links to the Keeping Track podcast and to the How She Did It book, which Molly co-authored with Sarah Slattery. And I'm going to link to the earlier episode we had featuring Molly, where she talks about the New York City Half Marathon. I will also provide links to the various organizations and doctors that Molly mentioned in her story, including Dr. Kate Ackerman and Mother and the Faster Program at Stanford. And that does bring us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I love making these stories, but I know that the power of them is in you being here. So thank you. As a reminder, I do not make this podcast by myself. Cormac O'Regan makes all the original music for the podcast, and he does that from his studio here in Cork, Ireland. I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am the host and producer of Women's Running Stories, and I am coming to you from my home closet studio, also in Cork, Ireland. And until next week, I wish you healthy, joyful strides forward. Women's Running Running. Running stories. stories. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.